I want to just sort of give a few more details about how you might put together an integrated pest management program. So let's start with everybody's favorite pest, slugs and snails. You got those around here anywhere? Okay. So the first thing that IPM program is recognizing the habitat that these slugs and snails like. What, what do slugs and snails like? Moisture. Everything. Moisture. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of moisture and the tender plants. And what else do they like? Don't Here. <laughs> <laughs> Hiding places. Like a place for hide. And so are you providing those in your garden? Or Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said no. Now, and I know some of you live pretty near the coast, so you may have a lot of natural beauty, but not really here in San Diego. I mean, before, uh, you know, the Westerners moved to San Diego, do you think there would have been a lot of habitat for slugs and snails? No. No, because it would have been dry, and you had your native plants. Um, and, and so, you know, and in fact, the slugs and snails that are problems, pest problems, we do have native slugs and snails, but they're not problems in our gardens. So they, they, you know, they know what to do. They, they're part of the ecosystem. They, they have their other places they want to hang out. These guys came from Europe, just like many of us. And, you know, the, the, the brown garden snails, that, that was brought up, brought over as escargot, right? In French. We had big dreams for that. And, then got it. and you can still Make your own escargot out of this. And that may be one way to deal with the problem. <laughs> and then these, these slugs, most of the slugs that are pests, they came over in, in the bottoms of boats from Europe along with the produce. But they're here. And we've got them. And so we have to accept the fact that we are providing habitat. So if you really don't want to deal with slugs and snails, I recommend you plant a native garden and don't irrigate and you will have a beautiful garden and no slice of snails. But if you want to have an English garden that you can with all this nice little plants, and you want to grow strawberries, and you want to grow some of those kinds of things, then, well, you're going to have to deal with it in an IPM program. But you can still you can keep that in mind, that habitat issue. You may want to have most of your garden in that, that nice, dry, non-irrigated native plants, but then you have one little part of your garden where you're growing your vegetables or certain of the flowers that you really like. And, and in those, you also try to keep the habitat less snail and slug favorable by, well, they need hiding places, so where are they? They're in ground covers, um, they're sometimes under mulches, they're, they, they hide in places during the, the heat of the day. So you remove those shelter places and, and consider drip irrigation. Because they need, in order to travel, they need a moist surface. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, if you just, if your soil is not sprinkle irrigated, um, they're, they're not going to be able to move very far on that dry surface. So that's why wherever you can use the drip irrigation, that's going to reduce your snail and slug problems. Mm -hmm. And you can choose snail-proof plants, and you probably know what these are, a lot of the native plants. A lot of plants have got a lot of hairs on them and some of this herb-like herb plants. Um, uh, there's many of them there. So in many cases, you can have a very attractive garden. Um, that's what I do. I don't want to deal with snails and slugs either. I just plant things that, that don't get snails and slugs, and I try to keep the habitat down. Uh, but um, you know, I find that there's lots of things that I can grow with. With, without having them. But if you want to grow vegetables, then that's an issue. Hand picking is really important for um, snails and slugs. You know, you, yeah, so snails are one thing, but slugs, then you definitely want to bring the gloves out. Uh, but, uh, but actually, hand picking is made uh, easier by using different kinds of traps. Some of you mentioned the beer traps, and there is a big contingent that loves beer traps. So those of you who have the beer traps are you, you and you can buy that you can make your own, or you can buy those ones that are sold that they're they're green, and you sink them into the ground, and you pour half a bottle of beer there, and you drink the other half, and then you put a little top on it, and they do attract the snails and slugs for about this far. And so then you have to put quite a few of them around your garden. 
And then once, once the, the thing is that the snail or slug has to drown in there, and if it dries up before they do that, they might just drag themselves back out. Uh, so you have to keep them the other thing is that I have heard this from master gardeners, and master gardeners are a great source of a lot of information. I've learned a lot of years. There. But on many occasions, people have told me about their drunk cats <laughs> or dogs. <laughs> so that, that, that's a hazard. So the kind of trap that I prefer to have a, uh, a picture of it uh, on the next page is, is a board trap. And usually I bring it, but I didn't have it, so I'm going to bring it here. The, you can make uh, a trap like this. So you've got some boards and you've got a uh, little... So it's held up. You put that on the ground on the ground uh, <coughs> at night, and in the morning you come and you'll have. Oh, you got one! Hey, oh, this one's really nice. It's all been sanded. You can also use crappy wood, and it works. Best as well. And this is a very nice one. Yeah, high class. But yeah, high class. Yeah. 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 And then they, they're there, and then you scrape them off into a bucket of water or into plastic bags, squash them, or feed them to your chickens or to your box turtle. You don't bathe them. No, they're just looking for shelter. So they, and, and you just put this out every every night or several of them out every night, and you will reduce your populations over time. It's like with earwigs, you know, the best thing to do is just continue to trap them out. With earwigs, so you're using a rolled, uh, rolled, rolled newspaper and, and dumping them. For these kinds of persistent pests that are hard to control, um, and that's the right thing. I mean, a farmer could do this, but you can in your yard, and you can really reduce the numbers. Yeah. Is it true if you step on a snail and it's an egg-laying snail that the eggs would still survive? So that's I don't, not a good idea. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think something would eat it. Um, okay. One more question. Isn't it also true that skunks love snails? Uh, well, so if awesome. you have skunks passing through at night. Uh, yeah, well, they like, I know they like rubs. I think they like rubs. I don't know. But they probably would eat some. So I, yeah, I think they do eat some possums will too. And so, hey, you got your biological control right there. Uh, but in any case, you probably want to keep your cells down anyway, and then maybe you're killing two things with one stone. But there's the trap. And then back to my little list there. Uh, the other thing is uh, copper bands, which I also have the picture of. They won't pass a copper um, uh, copper barrier, um, uh, and so you can so you reduce the habitat, you trap out as many as you can, and then for those vegetable gar vegetables and other tender plants that you really want to grow that are susceptible, a really good way to do that is to make a raised bed and then put a copper band around it. Make sure that the soil is <coughs> free of snails and slugs and their eggs first. And the snails and slugs will not pass over that barrier. And, and that can provide a good management program for snails and slugs. But you always have to keep, keep up you know, uh, trapping and hand picking. Um, uh, and, and that's just you know, part of your, your good gardening practices. Now we do have baits for uh, snails and slugs. But baits all by themselves aren't going to, they, they aren't going to work if you've got a big, bad snail and slug problem. You have to reduce the habitat uh, and, and, and do some of these other things. Because in the end, you know, what would a snail or slug rather eat? Bait or your nice tender plant? Probably the plant, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to uh, make it harder for them to get to that plant by keeping those surfaces not moist. Uh, by trapping them out um, and, and using different kinds of barriers. So the copper bands are one barrier. Uh, people do also use barrier, temporary barriers, things like dry ashes. I've heard eggshells. Uh, I even heard coffee grounds. If you have a real dry, it, it's hard for them to get over these dry, particularly abrasive surfaces. Uh, but once they get wet, then they won't be uh, uh, they, they won't uh, repel them for any longer, whereas the copper bands will last for years. They're expensive. But among the baits, so we have two kinds of baits. Uh, ten years ago, almost all the baits were metaldehyde. Um, and uh, 
Mentaldehyde is, uh, it has a lot of problems. It's very toxic to dogs, it's toxic to people, it has environmental issues. Um, and, but about 10 or 12 years ago, the iron phosphate products uh, were introduced, like Sluggo. And uh, these products are uh, not toxic to dogs, not significantly toxic to dogs. Um, and the environment, so they are much better, uh, much better choices, and we always are trying to promote those. But watch out for the sluggo that's got the, the spinosad in it, because there you're adding another toxin to the environment. There's other products besides sluggo, many other products that are iron phosphate. There's also a new uh, product, and I'll talk about that in the next issue, Ferric, um, uh, I can't remember, Ferric something, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's what the Corys has got. It's another iron product that's sort of, uh, it's better than metaldehyde, but I think it may not be quite as uh, environmentally sound as, as the iron phosphate. Uh, so here's copper barriers. So you can see you put a copper barrier around your, your tree, like citrus, the snails really like that, and that they won't be able to pass it. And here we've got a, you probably can't see it very well in this light, but there's a copper band around the, the uh, raised bed here. And these copper bands will last for years. If they get tarnished, you can clean them with them, I guess. Oh. <laughs> so, they don't show. integrated pest management. So, do you see how that all fit together? Did you start thinking like a snail or a slug? Yeah. So, you think about like what you would do. Yeah? Yeah, here I did the, uh, I, I have thousands of the and so I was a hand picker, and I'm not a chemical user of those, of those choices, but I use decorative snails and find them with great success. I use them in my garden. Right, okay, so that's that's a good point. Decolate snails. Decolate snails we're not, not allowed to use in, in Northern California. Um, so decolate snails are a predator of, of, of snails, and they are very uh, effective, but they are, in Southern California, they are around and you can use them. The thing about the decolate snails is, and they use them in citrus, commercial citrus orchards, and they are good. They will eat plants, though, and so they'll... Uh, they, they, they prefer to eat snails, but um, my understanding is they'll eat plants. And you're not allowed to bring them to s certain count to, to most of the non-citrus growing counties because of uh, not only will they eat plants, they'll eat native snails and things like that. So they, 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 they're not as, but it, you've got them here, so that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so another, uh, pest that is pretty common around are the uh, aphids. And so you're all familiar with the aphids. Most plants have aphids on them at one time or another. Um, sometimes not so many. Some aphids are sort of pear-shaped uh, insects, uh, often have long antennae, often have these sort of little corticles at their rear end. Um, they like to uh, uh, feed on um, uh, fresh, growing, uh, the most rapidly growing tissue, so you'll see them on buds, but not necessarily open flowers. You'll see them on the lush growth of terminals. Uh, they reproduce by, uh, uh, for most of the times, the females give live birth to little clones of themselves, and so they are very successful insects. They really have adapted to being successful, and there's many, many species of them, but um, they look similar and most of them are controlled in the same manner. The damage from aphids is primarily aesthetic, so they're sucking insects, so they're sucking the sap out of plants, and they have to concentrate that, so they're concentrating the amino acids so they get enough protein, and so they're putting out a lot of sugary liquid out their rear ends, <laughs> extruding it, and we call that honeydew. And so when you have a high Number of aphids, you see this sticky honeydew over your leaves. Sometimes it will be falling out of the sky onto your sidewalk or onto your cars. And then on that sticky honeydew, you get this black sooty mold that grows on it. And you know, and it's just, you know, you get under your shoes, you're tracking the house, your car looks awful. And you know, it's aesthetically unpleasing. But the thing about aphids is it is mostly, in most cases, aesthetic damage. And so uh, they're not actually hurt, doing much damage to the tree. 
Uh, what they are is they're damaging your aesthetic, you know, what you like to see in your tree. Mm -hmm. So they're not killing the tree. And for some people, and for many of these aphids, they're really only problems for maybe six weeks a year. So for a lot of people, if they can understand that in most cases, they're not hurting the tree, and it'll be over in six weeks, they can hold back and not use the big gun pesticides. But there are a few aphids that do have longer periods of time when they're problems, and some of them that cause a little bit more serious problems. But most aphids are, are, are really pretty benign other than that. Uh, so they produce honeydew and sooty mold. There are some species of aphids that do cause curling in the leaves. They, they inject a little toxin that causes the leaves to curl and maybe stunt. And, and those aphids uh, you know, cause ugly damage. Usually what happens is those leaves fall off the trees and new leaves come on. So for instance, with the ornamental plums, this is a common problem. I don't know why anybody plants ornamental plums, because you know you're going to have these aphids on them. Um, and the thing about that is when the aphids are feeding inside the curled leaves, um, they're protective. And so you, you can't control them with like a soap spray or an oil spray. Um, and they're protected also from their natural enemies. It's harder for their natural enemies to get into those curled leaves. So those, those are a little bit harder to manage. And then some species cause gall formations, like the woolly apple aphid. Um, and, and then again, those, those can be issues. But fortunately, woolly apple aphid has pretty good natural enemies. Um, and so the life cycle of the aphid, it's kind of interesting to understand the life cycle of your pest when you're managing it. Uh, so for most of the most of the year, uh, most of the aphid will have a life cycle which, um, so there's the female and she gives live birth without mating. So she's cloning herself to little aphids and then they um, molt. It's in complete metamorphosis so they look like mom, just a little smaller. Uh, and uh, uh, many generations of this. And so by not having males in the system, it's, it's a real boon to them because they're really reproducing twice as fast because you know they don't have those, those guys who aren't producing offspring. Uh, and so they, that's one reason why they can build up their population so fast. Yeah, an interesting system. But you know what? Later on, the, the, the guys are really important. Because you know what happens is for many of these plant species, in the winter time, they lose their leaves. And when they lose their leaves and they're not growing, the aphids are kind of out of luck because they don't have a way to survive. They're pretty vulnerable. And what they need is they need an egg to survive because it's when the leaves aren't there, there's not food for them to, to um, do. So uh, many of the aphid species in the fall, when they sense the leaf quality is getting poorer, the days are getting shorter, um, they uh, give birth, uh, this, this, this fall sexual female comes out, and she gives uh, birth to little males and little females. And they mate and lay an egg. And this is in the winter time, and so for many of the aphids, they overwinter as eggs on the bark of trees. Now in California, because we don't have really cold, aphid, cold winters, and probably particularly down here, Many of the aphids have adapted so they don't actually have to have an egg stage because there's food and it's warm. But particularly in the colder areas, um, these egg stages are essential for uh, overwintering. And then in the spring, they, um, uh, the egg hatches and then they go through this life cycle again. But you know, the other cool thing about aphids is many species don't produce wings um, except when they need them. Because again, wings are just another use of energy. And if that, uh, so many species only, you'll see adult aphids that have wings and adult aphids that don't have wings. Um, and usually the wings are produced when the food quality is going down, which means they need their wings to go somewhere else. But if the food quality is great, you know, why waste your energy on wings when you can pump out another couple of offspring with that energy? And so I, I, I like aphids a lot. I think they're really interesting. <laughs> That's probably more than you needed to know about aphids. But, you know, people think of these insects as just being, you know, simple. But they, they, have, they have evolved amazing 
ways to deal with the environment, and that's why they're so successful. Many other species um, probably didn't die, didn't survive because they were uh, so imaginative. So when you're thinking of uh, managing aphids, remember they don't kill trees. They're often short-term problems uh, and in mild weather. You guys have mild weather all the time down here, but um, where it gets really hot, and I know it gets hotter a little bit farther inland there, um, then the aphids, most of the aphid species really don't like it. Um, most species of aphids uh, are host-specific, so you can choose plants that don't have aphid problems. If you want aphid problems, I recommend uh, flowering plants, <laughs> crape myrtle, roses, tulip trees, apples, and all kinds of vegetables. And the benefit of having aphids is you're going to have lady beetles. And lady beetles are really nice. I mean, so like a tulip tree, um, I don't know if you have tulip trees here, but we have a lot of them in Sacramento. And they are big aphid producers. And they're always covered with lady beetles and uh, various different species, so good sites for them. They like the lush vegetation, so over-fertilize your plants, <laughs> you a lot, and you'll get more aphids. Pruning them at the wrong time will also cause that lush vegetation. But the good news about aphids is that there's lots of different natural enemies, they're often abundant, and they're often very effective. Um, and you want to, and one way to allow the natural enemies to do their best at controlling uh, aphids, you need to keep ants out of trees because the ants tend the aphids and protect them from natural enemies. So the management tools for aphids are cultural practices, natural enemies, water sprays, and a lot of times the water spray is all you really need to knock, knock these off, doesn't leave a, a residue. And then for pesticides, insecticidal soaps and oils are uh, fairly benign. Um, less don't leave residues that are toxic to natural enemies or bees and things. The metacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, <coughs> is effective against aphids. It's that systemic uh, insecticide. You apply it to the soil. Uh, I understand that it is the number one sold insecticide. And I'm sure it is in stores. I mean, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it does have some useful purposes, like right now when we're battling the Asian citrus psyllid. But for most of your aphid problems, for aphid problems, um, the insecticidal oils or soaps are you know, much more environmentally sound and satisfactory solution. Most other, it's, I, I don't really recommend any other insecticides, even for really bad problems. Um, so ant management, I've talked about this several times. So the ants will tend, these are woolly aphids here, they're tending the, um, so can you see a line of the ants crawling up? They are not crawling up there for the view. <laughs> they are crawling up there for a reason, because ants are singly you know, focused on feeding the colony. So there's something up there in the tree that's going to feed the colony. And usually it's a honeydew producing insect. Now if it's a tree with ripening fruit on, well, it's probably the ripening fruit. If it's a, if, if sometimes you'll have an <laughs> uh, injury or a disease that's caused sap to come out, and that might be attracting aphids. But a, lot, but a lot of times it's one of these honeybee producing insects like aphids. And in fact, for a very big tree, that might be your first uh, indicator that you have aphids in the tree is seeing this crawl, this line of ants. Uh, and so they're up there, and you know, they are, so the, the aphids are their little cows, and they're, they're farming for the honeydew that they can, they take the droplet of honeydew and they bring it down to their colony. Um, so you can, uh, so they're, so they're very, and they'll, they'll pick up the aphids and, and take them to another part of the tree because they're farming and they want to expand the farm. So they actually distribute them, them through the tree. But, but even more importantly, they will knock, knock off the parasitoids or the lady beetles or other things trying to feed them. So if you put um, a, a tangle foot on a um, trunk band there, you can keep them out of a tree. For smaller plants, it's um, more difficult. What is that? It's a uh, tanglefoot is a sticky, uh, a sticky uh, substance, and you can put it on a, a bark band around the tree. You can also try to manage the, the uh, ants through things like baits uh, and other barriers. The biggest problem with this 
is keeping the ants out of the tree. Now, we did, I did some research many years ago, 15 years ago, and we were provided with this piece of plastic that was, was impregnated with um, uh, uh, py permethrin, which is a pyrethroid, very persistent uh, uh, pyrethroid that lasts for like six months. We wrapped this around trees, kept the ants out, but nobody's manufacturing this product. It would be a perfect solution. I, I think somebody could make money off of it. But. <laughs> Uh, we've got data, and, and I think John Potts of Riverside also worked for this product. Okay, we talked about the parasitic wasp before, and you've seen this life cycle before. So parasites are very important in the control of aphids, and you frequently see them. There's many different species of parasites. Uh, most of them just focus on a few different closely related species of aphids. Uh, and they, they, after they kill the aphid, their uh, skins, we call them mummified, their skins get crusty and usually this sort of beige color. You can see it's burst like a balloon. And then this one, uh, uh, a wasp has emerged, just cut a hole in. So uh, there are other, uh, some of the species of uh, parasites turn the mummies beige, and there's other species that turn them black and crusty. And so look for these. Has anybody ever seen these in their aphid population? You haven't? Oh, yeah. Ooh. Do you have aphids? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, well, start looking for this. You should be seeing lots of aphids. Okay, the convergent lady beetle. So, as we, I talked about before, lady beetles are very important predators. The red and black lady beetles focus on uh, aphids. Uh, this convergent lady beetle is, is a na our native lady beetle, one of our many native lady beetles, but our most common. Uh, aphid feeding lady beetle. It's got those converging white markings here. And uh, so she lays eggs. Eggs hatch into larvae. Larvae are very important predators of aphids. And they have the benefit of not flying away, too. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then when it's uh, ready to turn into adult, it pupates. So, so many people, they recognize the adult, but they don't recognize the larvae. And they will actually bring larvae. Sometimes when you have a plant that's really covered with aphids, You'll get a lot of lady beetles on it, and then you'll get a lot of lady beetle larvae on it. And I've talked to many master gardeners where people have brought lady beetle larvae in thinking they were pests uh -huh. and want to know how to control them. Um, so this convergent lady beetle has a, uh, a, a unique life cycle, uh, and um, it, <coughs> what it does, um, it spends the winters up in the mountains or in the foothills. Uh, it's not active, but it's there. Well, they're in huge aggregations in some place where there's water, <coughs> and they're doing a little mating, taking in water. Um, but often, has anybody ever seen a lady beetle grouping back? There's somebody back there. These, this is one of the wonders of the world. One of the wonders of the world because it's got you know it'll be you know a hundred yards wide you know, many yards deep of just crawling with millions of lady beetles. And that's how they, they're over winter. They go up there in the, in, the, in the winter, and then when it gets warmer, around March, about 55 or uh, 65 degrees, um, then they catch the winds down to the valleys, um, and um, these are adults, and then lay eggs and have a number of generations of uh, lady beetles down here. Then in June, when it starts getting hot and there's fewer aphids, the lady beetles start going back up to the mountains. There's lady beetles, convergent lady beetles out all the way up till November 1st, um, uh, but uh, fewer of them because there's fewer aphids. And so they're up there in the mountains doing this. And because they've got these huge aggregations, uh, we've got a whole industry of lady beetle collectors who go up there and collect the lady beetles and put them in little bags and sell them to you for $7.95 for 50 right? And so we always hear from you, from you're, you're going to get people saying, well, should I buy the, the lady beetles in little bags? Do they work? And um, uh, for years, the university said, no, they don't work. They just fly away. And I would come to Master Gardeners and they said, well, they did actually work for me. And see, this is, this is why I don't talk to Master Gardeners. And I heard it so many times, and my professor, Ken Hagen, who is the lady beetle, who was the lady beetle expert of the whole 
century, last century. Uh, he even followed them in a hot air horn. <laughs> <laughs> and this was all recorded in the New Yorker. When you get the New Yorker article on your research, yeah. you made it. <laughs> so, but he said, well, you know, they just float away, so I believe it. But the master gardeners <laughs> told me so many times that they decided that, um, well, we're going to go. So I looked at the literature, and there was literature saying they fly, flew away, but there was no literature on whether they ate the aphids. And so Steve Dries, who works, Steve Dries, who works with me, and I decided, well, we're going to prove that you know, they don't work. And so we did. We did three years of research, and we found out that yes, they do fly away. Uh, uh, you put on lady beetles at, um, on your plants in fairly high numbers. Um, 95% of them will fly away in, in um, uh, the first uh, 24 hours. But the remaining 5%, the 5 that remains, they remain and they clean the plants up. And then they fly away after they've cleaned up the plants, which is usually two or three la days later. They don't lay eggs, and we, we, paint, we colored them, we tagged them, and, so, and we could see that they didn't, they didn't go to nearby plants. They, they, they went way far away. So what that means is that they're certainly as effective as a soap spray or an oil spray. They don't leave toxic residues, which would be their eggs, but they did clean up the, the, um, the plants. At the time, we were working with the city of Davis and, and, and their rose garden, and we were able to show that releasing two releases of lady beetles was economically competitive with using a mid clover that's systemic uh, and as effective. Which was good. But what did the city of Davis do to its rose garden? It pulled it out and planted native plants, so it doesn't have even problems. <laughs> anyway, they they have to be handled very carefully. You go on our website. There's uh, on the lady beetle page. There, there's information on that. Uh, so they can be effective, uh, but they require handling in fairly large numbers. And yes, 95% of them fly away, but the other 5% can't clean up. But you have to have a lot, if you don't have a lot of lady, a lot of aphids, they're not going to stay. And so if you only have one or two aphids, I mean, that's not enough food for lady beetles. You better have a good population for them to stick around for. So there's a, no, I'm going to go through this. I think I need to go through this because I'm, I'm, I'm going to have time. So there's other lady beetles, this uh, Harmonia, which is a large uh, the Asian multicolored lady beetle, actually was imported into California. Uh, to control the con aphid, but it's all now in our ecosystems. Big lady beetles, different color variations. This is the larvae, there's the pupae. This one doesn't overwinter in the mountain. It sometimes overwinters in homes. Um, in fact, we even get some complaint calls from it, but not so much in California where it's warm in the, in the, in the winter, probably not here at all, a little bit. I got a call once from the Chico State <coughs> dorms complaining about these things. But back east, like in Ohio, places where it gets really cold in the winter, um, they overwinter in people's attics and houses, or actually considered pests. But they're voracious lady beetles, and so they're there. But there's a lot of other red and black lady beetles out there, too. And you can learn how to identify them in the Natural Lands Handbook or on our website. Lacewings, probably familiar with these. They're general predators, but they do feed on aphids. Uh, it's the larval stage here with the aphid and its mandibles um, that uh, is the, the predaceous uh, uh, stage. We've got, uh, they, they lay their eggs on stalks, really cool looking. So when you see these stalked eggs on your plants, usually on a, this is asparagus with a lot of aphids on it, um, then you know biological control is going to come. This is the, the adult, um, not, most species are not predaceous. <laughs> Surfing flies, another common, um, Aphid feeder, again, the adult is a pollen feeder, needs a pollen meal in order to, to reproduce. There's the egg, and it's the larval stage of the, the serpent fly. There's two different species shown here. That is the aphid feeder. It looks a little bit like a caterpillar, but it doesn't have the true six true legs. It's a maggot. Um, and there's no holes in the leaves. Caterpillars eat leaves. You got something that's not eating holes in the leaves, take another look. What you can see here is the cast skins of aphids, that it's, uh, many of which have eaten. This cantharid or soldier beetle is another predator of aphids out there. So there's lots of predators out in your garden. There's also sometimes fungal diseases. 
Um, the best insecticides are uh, oils and soaps. You, the oils, you can have petroleum-based uh, oils and also um, plant-based oils like neem or canola. Um, they work in a similar kind of way, particularly on these soft-bodied insects. The imidacloprid, which we've talked about before, um, there's been a lot of talk about this uh, product because um, I mean, it is now the wonder, wonder drug for insecticides. Like I said, it's the most widely sold insecticide now. Um, and for a long time, people thought it didn't really have environmental hazards because it's uh, put into the soil, the plant takes it up through the roots, it gets into the leaves, the aphid feeds on the leaves and, and is killed. But it also does get into the nectar of flowers and into the pollen of flowers. And so it can have negative impacts on honeybees and parasitic wasps. Um, and so um, it also, when it's as a soil drench, it it's, can have toxic effects on earthworms. And so we're saying, you know, save this for only the very most serious problems. Uh, and usually not for aphids. A hackberry woolly aphid, which I don't know whether you have here, is, is one case. Uh, and then the Asian citrus salad, particularly in areas where it's um, just coming in and you're trying to reduce its spread. So for IPA, for aphids, uh, know that they're aesthetic. They don't kill trees, so you can tolerate them. Natural enemies are your real key to aphid control. Wash, um, washing off or soap sprays um, are, are the best uh, thing. Don't over fertilize your plants uh, because that will likely increase your aphid problems. Um, and I'm not going to go through... Um